Between 1910 and 1912, a bizarre anomaly happened in American history, where axe murders cropped up everywhere. Places like Colorado Springs, Iowa, Kansas, and even Louisiana. Many murders were credited to an imaginary man who rode the rails to satiate his bloodlust, while others believed it to be the work of the infamous New Orleans axe murderer. One February afternoon in 1911, police of West Crowley, Louisiana received a call from concerned citizens who worried something had happened to their neighbor. Officer Bellew reported to the urgent call, but nothing could prepare him for the scene he would soon discover. The home's occupants, a husband, wife, and child, had all been murdered in their sleep. Their skulls had all been split open. The beds were drenched in blood, and bloody footprints trailed the floor. As the doors to the home were locked, it was indicated that the perpetrator must have used the window to enter the house while the family slept. One of the officer's most gruesome discoveries was a bucket of blood, and the bloodied axe left at the head of the bed. This instance was only one of the many axe slayings that would terrify towns of Louisiana and Texas along the Southern Pacific Railroad. This railroad system connected New Orleans, Louisiana to Beaumont, Texas. After a tip from his mistress, the police soon suspected Raymond Barnabet, a sharecropper and petty thief from Lafayette, Louisiana. During Raymond's trial in October 1911, his children testified against him, stating that he would often come home with bloody clothes and brag about murdering families. Both children said they feared he would murder them if he were free. On November 26, 1911, while Raymond Barnabet was in jail, another murder happened. In Lafayette, Norbert Randall, his wife, Three children and nephew were all murdered with an axe. However, there was one horrific detail that was different. As the rest of the members were slain, Norbert was shot in the head. Welcome to another episode of Crimson Sin with Tams and Lee. I am your host, Tams and Lee. Show notes and sources can be found in the description. Also, stay up to date with the latest from me by following or supporting my Buy Me a Coffee page, which you can also find in the description. Don't forget to like, follow, or subscribe to make sure you do not miss an episode. Also, comment your thoughts about each case or provide a request. I enjoy interacting with my listeners. Today's story concerns Clementine Barnabet, infamous for the voodoo murders. This case happened in the 1900s, so it is old, but it is a very bizarre one. Her story comprises darkness, mystery, and potentially the involvement in a cult and the occult. As a disclaimer, I found a series of newspaper clippings from the time this case happened, so some of the names may be inconsistent with names you may find on the internet. Also, I tried to stay consistent with the dates I found in the newspaper articles, so there may be some inconsistencies there because, let's be real, record keeping was not that great back then. Since record keeping was less detailed than it is now, it is believed that Clementine Barnabet was born around 1894 in St. Martinville, Louisiana to Raymond Barnabet and Nina Porter. Clementine's father, Raymond, was a sharecropper, which was not a profitable career. Sharecropping is a legal agreement in that a landowner who owns agricultural land allows the tenant to use the farmland for a share of the crops produced. The system worked because the landowner provided a percentage of their land to be operated by the sharecropper. The landowner also usually provided the necessities such as animals, seeds, tools, and housing. Local merchants would also offer food and other supplies on credit. 
In exchange for all of this, at the end of the season, the tenant would pay the owner a share of the crop. This share could have been one half to two thirds of the claim. After the owner received his share of the money, the tenant would have to repay the merchant to pay off this debt. If there was any money left over, this is what the tenant made and could keep. However, if his share was less than what he owed, he remained in debt. Sharecropping sounds like a very erratic business. I mean, even when you're farming, there is no guarantee that you're going to have a profitable season. So you can only imagine how frustrating sharecropping could actually be. You could do well in some seasons while you won't make a thing in others. So Raymond would also make a career as a petty thief to help bring money in. He was described as not a very good man in life. Not only did he steal as a means to support his family, but he also constantly cheated on his wife and would physically abuse his family. Along with her parents, Clementine lived with her older brother, Zephyrin. Some reports state that she had four brothers, while others state that her only sibling is Zephyrin. The Barnabet family lived in a rundown, poverty-stricken town. From this type of childhood, Clementine did not have an easy upbringing. In 1909, the family moved to Lafayette. So this was a time when Lafayette started booming. Lafayette was originally called Vermilionville and had a trade post near the Vermilion River. In 1884, Vermilionville was no longer a village, with a small trading post and became a town. With the town came a new name. Many people were coming to settle in Lafayette from Texas and Oklahoma. So this case took place during this little economic boom. Of course, just because a city is growing and seeing incredible highs does not mean everyone in town is doing wonderful financially. Unfortunately for the Barnabet family, they experienced these hardships. 1909 began a gruesome and fearful time for many African-American families living in Louisiana. Edna Opelousas and her three children were found bludgeoned to death in Rain, Louisiana, which is roughly 15 miles west of Lafayette. There is some speculation that this act may not have been linked to the murders that ensued in 1911. However, this would align with Clementine's allegation that she committed her first sacrifice at 15 years old. When Clementine was 17 years old, her family started the cult called the Church of Sacrifice, believing that killing sinners would lead them to immortality. The Church of Sacrifice is an offshoot of Christ's sanctified holy church. It is speculated that this supposed church had two other unidentified members. This was, in fact, a cult in which Clementine was a leader at only 17 years old. The organization was said to have provided solace for the Barnabet family, as it provided opportunities for male and female members alike. The first confirmed murder of the Church of Sacrifice occurred in February 1911. This was the Byers family of West Crowley, which was discussed at the opening of this episode. According to sources, this was a poor part of town, which usually overlooked murders. However, this murder was so brutal that it could not be so easily dismissed. On Saturday, February 25th, police were contacted about another incident in the Lafayette area. They found that Alexander Andrus, his wife Mimi, and their son, aged 8, and daughter, 11 months old, suffered the same fate as the Byers family. Mimi's brother, Lazim Felix, discovered the terrifying scene at 7 in the morning. Sheriff Lacoste and Deputy Coroner Clark were dispatched to the scene. Alexander, Mimi, and their son were murdered in their beds with an axe to their heads. The baby was still lying in the cradle, was struck with its head crushed. Both adults were then taken up on their knees beside the bed, with Mimi's arms wrapped around Alexander's shoulder as if they were praying. The baby was then placed beside the mother. The police also noticed that the murder weapon, an axe, was left at the crime scene. 
It was believed by Dr. Clark that the murders took place sometime after midnight. Sheriff Louis Lacoste suspected the murderer from both cases had to be the same individual. He assumed the brutal murders must have been committed by a recently escaped lunatic from the Pineville area named Garkin Godfrey. The police arrested Godfrey's mother who informed them that Garkin could not have committed the crimes as he was at Maurice. They found Garkin, however they could not connect him to the crimes as parties from Maurice asserted Garkin was there the whole time. Investigators kept Godfrey in jail until he could be transported back to the asylum. On March 22, 1911, the murderer struck again. In San Antonio, Texas, Louis Cassaway, his wife, and their three children were murdered, similarly to the previous two families. However, investigators found two key differences. First, the murder happened in Texas, while the others occurred in Louisiana. Second, Miss Cassaway was Caucasian. Every target was African American up until this point. Because Mrs. Cassaway was Caucasian, investigators initially believed this was a hate crime. According to a newspaper article, Sheriff Lacoste and Texas authorities were in contact since the cases were similar. After investigators experienced a few false starts and bad leads, they finally received a break in the case. Their initial belief was disproved when police received an unexpected confession from Raymond Barnabet's mistress. Not long after the Cassaway's murders, the mistress told police that Raymond confessed to murdering the family during one of their fights. Because Raymond had a long rap sheet and was known to have a volatile temper, Sheriff Lacoste had him arrested as soon as possible. Raymond stood trial in Louisiana in October 1911 of the Byers family, the Andrus family, and the Cassaway family murders. Clementine and Zephyrin testified against their father during the trial, pinning all the murders on him. Clementine recalled a night when her father returned home covered in blood while threatening his family. Zephyrin confirmed the story while adding that their father bragged about murdering the Andrus family. What sealed Raymond's fate was his children expressing their fear of their father, claiming they were not safe if Raymond remained free. Even though Raymond provided an alibi for the night of the Broussard family murders, his wife and the Stevens family, who lived with the Barnabets, claimed his innocence for the Andrus murders. A Louisiana jury convicted Raymond. His punishment was to be hanged for his crimes. However, he was granted a new trial, stating that he was drunk on the night of the first murders. As Raymond sat in jail awaiting for his new trial, on November 26, 1911, another murder took place. In their cabin on Lafayette Street, Norbert Randall and his wife, Azima, their three children and nephew, were murdered. The bodies were discovered by their 10-year-old daughter, who spent the night at her uncle's house. It was reported that the daughter found the kitchen door to be opened when she arrived home, and upon entering, she found her parents and the children murdered in their bed. Norbert appeared to have been shot in the head before receiving a strike from an axe. The children, aged 8, 6, 5, and 2, had been beaten to death by the blunt end of the axe. As in the other cases, the axe was left at the crime scene, but it appeared to have been cleaned. Unfortunately, any evidence outside the home was washed away by the rain. It was also reported that Norbert, his wife, and the baby girl were found in one bed, and the three boys were in another, all found to be struck in the head. This led Sheriff Lacoste to believe that Raymond had accomplices. Something about the Barnabet children seemed to disturb the sheriff, and he wanted to revisit them. Many people were suspicious of the Barnabet children, who were not well liked in the community. The neighbors described Clementine and Zephyrin as filthy, shifty degenerates. Another critical detail that disturbed many was that when Raymond was arrested, Clementine had blood 
on her dress. When questioned about it, she stated that her father wiped his hands on her dress. While searching the Barnabet home, the investigators discovered several of Clementine's blood-stained clothes with what appeared to be bits of human brains. It was also reported that the latch on the door was slicked with blood. Investigators quickly arrested Clementine, Zephyrin, and two cult members. During questioning, Zephyrin was released as he provided an alibi for the night of the murder. During this time, District Attorney Rubira received a phone call from Chemist Metz of New Orleans on Wednesday, January 17, 1912, who tested the blood on Clementine's clothing and confirmed they found pieces of brain. With Clementine and Raymond in jail, many people felt safe. However, the murders soon continued. In January 1912, three more murders occurred while the cult was under Zephyrin's leadership. On January 19, 1912, 30-year-old Marie Warner and her three children, aged 9, 7, and 5, were found at noon, murdered with an axe in a hut in Crowley. She and her husband had been separated for four years, and he had been living in Beaumont at the time of this incident. The crime was discovered by Ben Robinson, who was enticed to enter the house when Marie's mother was too scared to enter through the back door, which was left open. Upon entering the home, Robinson found the mangled bodies lying in bed in the front room. Investigators believed the victims were killed while they slept, and some occupants were murdered in the back room. However, the perpetrator moved the bodies to the bed in the front room. All of the victims were lying face down on the bed. The only evidence discovered at the crime scene was a blood-stained axe left in the room with the bodies. Tracks led from the back of the house, leading investigators to speculate that multiple suspects committed this crime. They also sent for bloodhounds to track the murderer or murderers down. If bloodhounds were brought in, and if they found any evidence, it is unknown. Zephyrin Barnabet was taken into police custody despite having an alibi for these murders. Police suspected that Zephyrin was carrying out either his father's or Clementine's or both of their wishes. The third family in this killing spree was the Broussards. I tried to find more information on the other victims at this time. However, I think how the Broussards were found overshadowed the other two slain families. On Saturday, January 20th, 1912, Felix Broussard, his wife, and three children were killed in their Lake Charles, Louisiana home. This time, the scene was a little different. The victim's hands were splayed apart with pieces of wood, and a message was left behind. Some speculated it was written in pencil, while others believed it was written in blood on the wall. The letter was a rendition of Psalm 912 in the King James Bible and said, When he maketh the inquisition for blood, he forgotteth not the cry of the humble. In the end, it was signed, The Human Five. This led investigators to believe that they had multiple murderers at work. Many rumors and speculations were being made after news broke about this incident. With newspapers circulating the newly gruesome discovery, the crimes were linked to a voodoo ritual. The press suggested the deceased families were human sacrifices, which utilized the importance of the number five. It was speculated that families of five were the target of the heinous crimes. This caused rumors to spread like wildfire about Clementine being a part of a cult called the Church of Sacrifice, which not only allowed one immortality, but could also allow one to obtain wealth. Furthermore, it was alleged that the cult was led by Reverend King Harris, a Pentecostal revival preacher in Jennings. King was arrested as a suspect in connection with the Randall murders. It was known that King had held a meeting approximately one half block from the Randall home and that the Randall family had attended this meeting. While investigators were confident that they had their two murderers in prison, 
They believed that this case was carried out by some fanatical belief or teaching. However, when Harris was asked about his potential involvement in these murders and the cult, he stated he was disgusted to hear people thought his sermons could have influenced such horrific crimes. 